Alrighty, let's get going. So, everybody had a good lunch? It's full, still awake? Cool. <laughs> uh, I'm Marcus, uh, I work at Atlassian, and I've been there about five, five and a half years now. And I've spent the majority of that time with the Bitbucket team, actually. So I work on Bitbucket Cloud. Now, I've been a back-end engineer with Bitbucket only since 2014. So I really have my roots in support. And it kind of gives me an interesting and unique perspective, I think, since I've had a lot of time before I was a developer working with Bitbucket and helping people coming over from other code review tools and other, just other methodologies in the past, like Subversion, and moving over to Get and starting to use pull requests. Now, of course, pull requests aren't the only thing that we've ever done at Atlassian. As a matter of fact, we used to have no code review. <laughs> Back when we started in 2002, it was just our founders, and they were working on Jira just side by side, and as they hired more people, they kind of kept, uh, kept with and adapted the uh, extreme programming methodology of pair programming. Now this is where two people might sit at a keyboard together, they collaborate on code, it's sort of like an instant code review. Now of course, this changed over time. As we added a lot more people, we eventually also acquired a company called Synqua. Now Synqua brought with it three very cool tools um, that have changed a lot of how we operate in Atlassian since then. The first one is Clover, which is a code coverage tool. Has anybody in here actually used Clover? A couple of people, cool. Uh, it also brought over FishEye. Who's familiar with FishEye? Oh, like 80% of the crowd, cool. And also Crucible. Who's familiar with Crucible? About the same amount of people. Uh, and you know, usually people get FishEye and Crucible together. So uh, now, of course, time progressed. Git Mercurial became more popular, and in 2010, we acquired Bitbucket. So at the time, Bitbucket was just a Mercurial hosting tool, but very soon after, we added support for Git. Turns out that was probably a good idea, <laughs> as now we have about 10 times as many Git repositories on Bitbucket as we do Mercurial. Now, more than just a Git host, we also, we also had got pull requests with it, and pull requests have really changed the way, changed the way again that Atlassian really works. Uh, it was actually so popular that a couple of our team members who work on our server products got together in 2011 and made a self-hosted Git hosting tool uh, called Caviar. Uh, and they built this during a Ship It, which is one of our quarterly hackathons, uh, and it was lucky enough to win. But Caviar wasn't a very great name. So about a year later, when we finally released it to the public, we called it Stash. Now Stash, when it first shipped, was just a Git hosting tool with some security around it. Not too soon after that, we went ahead and released Stash 2.0, which brought pull requests. So at this point now, we have pull requests basically being used by just about every team in Atlassian. Fast forward a couple more years, after a lot of iteration on pull requests and both Bitbucket Cloud and Stash, we decided to go ahead and rename Stash to Bitbucket Server. And then since then, we've spent a lot of time iterating on pull requests to really improve uh, try to improve people's workflow and also bring in some of, the better, some of the better things that we've learned along the way. Now, of course, more than just pull requests, we're here to talk about a couple other things. So today we're actually gonna cover four different styles of code review and different tools that you might use to, to do those. So the first one we're gonna cover is pre-commit code review. So this is where you might send around a patch to different people for review, and then it eventually gets merged in or committed in later by a maintainer post-commit code review. So this is where your code's probably already been merged into your main line, it may have already even been deployed, but you wanna go back and take a look at it. We're gonna look at Garrett, which is kind of unique into itself in the way it works. So we're gonna talk about it by itself. And then of course, finally, we're gonna talk about pull requests. The way we're gonna evaluate each of these or talk about each of these is based on a couple of criteria. So first of all, creation. So how easy it is to actually create the code review. Iteration, so once you get feedback, how easy it is to contribute changes back into that same code review. Collaboration, of course, which is people making comments, going back and forth. And then finally, history, so what your code base kind of looks like at the end of the code review process. So let's start and talk about pre-commit code review. Now, pre-commit code review is usually found in pretty large open source projects where you're trying to contribute but you don't have right access. So what you'd normally do is pull down the code, make some changes, and then email them into a mailing list where then people will collaborate back and forth with you, make some comments, and then eventually a maintainer will take those changes from the email and commit them for you to master. 
And of course, this enables you and them to pull down those latest changes. So let's look at a slightly more concrete example of how this could work. So let's say we're working for an airline and we found a nice open source project to help us calculate our fare taxes and fees. So we found a small bug though. So if we notice, we're adding our immigration fee, our customs fees, but our federal transport tax might be being calculated a bit wrong for our fare. Everyone see that? So we should probably want to contribute a little fix, make sure that we don't reduce the fare. And so the way we do that in a mailing list workflow is actually go out to Git, which is my preferred tool, and <laughs> use Git format patch. And Git format patch will actually spit out a nice little diff like this, but you'll notice there's a couple of headers that look like they belong in an email. You can then use Git to email that patch to a mailing list, where then the maintainers will look at your patch, make some comments in line with your changes. You might reply with a few more comments and changes. And this could continue on for a while. As a matter of fact, if you have a pretty complex change or there's a lot of comments, this could get pretty unwieldy pretty fast. It's maybe not ideal. <laughs> so once everyone's done and, you're, and the maintainer's ready to commit your changes, they're going to take the final patch and just the final patch and create a single commit. Now, this is good for a clean history, but it might also be a little cumbersome if you have a lot of people that have worked on a feature or contributed to a patch. There's only going to be one author and one committer that's going to be associated with this change in the destination repo. Now, the mailing list workflow definitely isn't all bad. There's a certain large open source project out there that uses a mailing list exclusively to operate. And I think that Linus likes his uh, mailing list workflow quite a bit. As a matter of fact, he said that uh, he doesn't feel that the mailing list is in any way a hindrance to working on the Linux kernel. As a matter of fact, the Linux kernel has about two to 300 emails per day going back and forth with patches and comments and so on. In a recent release, there were probably about 13,000 patches. So that's, that's a lot of emails. <laughs> Another project that uses the mailing list workflow actually is Git itself. So even though Git is what provides for the pull request workflow, Git still is maintained via mailing list by a single maintainer and a set of core contributors who make comments and address patches. So that's pre-commit review, sort of in a nutshell. Uh, some pros, it's version control agnostic. It's very universal diff format. You can send it around from any tool. You use whatever tools you choose. It's very simple. Again, using your own tools, it's probably easier for everyone. Um, it's very easy to keep hundreds or maybe even thousands of people in the loop, depending on how many people are subscribed to a mailing list. But there's also some downsides. It might be a little difficult to iterate. So if you have a lot of changes going back and forth, there's got to be a lot of inline comments. You're going to be contributing new patches into the mail, and then people are going to be replying to those. It's going to go back and forth quite a bit. Um, another problem that, you could that could arise is <laughs> being able to actually visualize the code. So a plain text diff has no colorization. There's no syntax highlighting. So it might be a little difficult to see what's going on. And of course, as I said a minute ago, there's only one contributor per patch. So for large teams or teams that are looking for detailed accountability, this could be a problem. And then finally, you have to manually merge in those changes. So that's pre-commit code review. So let's talk a little bit about post-commit code review. Now, most post-commit code review tools offer some sort of web UI that allows you to see the diff. It sort of colorized like this, where you have a red line for what's been changed or removed and a green line for what's coming in. A lot of tools also allow you to make inline comments or threaded comments. And then, of course, this is a screenshot from Bitbucket server, by the way. Uh, a lot of tools do show you all of the files that are, that are involved in a particular uh, code review. Now, before we get on to talking about Bitbucket and pull requests, let's talk a little bit about Crucible and how it helps you do post-commit code reviews. Now, Crucible, in addition to showing you all the things we just talked about, adds quite a few interesting features. So the first one is being able to actually assign an end date or a due date to a code review. So what will happen is all of the reviewers on your code review will receive a notification that they have a specific due date, and they'll get reminder emails leading all the way up until the due date. So that's pretty cool. And then out of your reviewers, Crucible is actually doing something pretty neat in the background, and it's watching, it's watching you watch the, pull, uh, sorry, the code review. <laughs> and it's tracking all the time that you're spending. 
So if you, have, if you have Crucible integrated with Jira, you can actually turn on time tracking and get this time automatically added back to the, to the source tickets. In addition, you'll also see that there's some percentage reviewed uh, notes on here. And that's whenever you're looking, as you're scrolling through files, Crucible's actually tracking what you have and haven't seen so that it knows how far along the, pull, the, uh, the code review is to completion. And then as your reviewers are working, if they detect certain things that maybe are a defect, they can flag those and actually open issues directly in Crucible. Of course, all this gets summarized nicely over on the left side where you can see how far along your review is and how much work you have left to do. Another cool thing that Crucible allows you to do is actually kind of pick and choose how you want to build your code review. So you can start with an individual commit. You can add in a whole branch from some other location. You can add in individual files from elsewhere in the repository that maybe weren't even directly related to the changes you've included in the commits. You can even upload individual patches, and Crucible will try to detect what those patches belong to and anchor them accordingly. And finally, something else cool you can do is you can actually include multiple repositories. So if you have a big feature, or maybe you're working with a microservice architecture, you can bring in changes from lots of different sources into one code review. So another thing that Crucible allows you to do is iterative code review. So as you come in and as you're viewing and, and Crucible's tracking your, what you've viewed, it is going to actually auto-adjust this slider. And then, of course, at any time, you can come back and readjust it, and Crucible will remember where you left off. So this is pretty helpful if you have a really large change or a really s large set of, of things to review. Now, slight drawback is that Crucible is not a host for version control meaning that your code must be hosted elsewhere. So that could be Bitbucket, that could be anything else you have. And what Crucible will do is it actually reaches out to all the different sources and pulls it in and creates a nice abstraction layer on top of that. So it can be kind of double-edged. So on the one hand, you have this nice abstraction layer that allows you to bring in maybe code from Subversion, from Git, from Perforce. But then on the other side of it, it's all read-only. So when you need to make changes, you need to go back to wherever the source lives, make those changes, resubmit them, update the code review, and so on. And of course, once you're done, if you're reviewing code that hasn't yet been merged into a ma main branch, you do have to, go that, you have to go and do that elsewhere. So let's take another look at post-commit review in review. <laughs> um, so su Crucible supports lots of different popular version control systems. Uh, it's very flexible to review content. You can bring in things from just about anywhere. It's pretty easy to iterate. So as you make changes, you go and update the code review and so on, and it's tracking those changes, so your team knows what's going on. But on the downside, you do need to host your code elsewhere. That could be a problem for some. You have to manually merge your work, and this kind of results in it being a little hard to enforce process. So some teams have requirements that maybe they need a certain amount of sign-offs on code before it goes out to production. And this is gonna be a little bit disjointed from your actual merge and from the tool that you're using to host your code. So that's post-commit review. So now let's take a quick look at Garrett. So Garrett's a pretty unique tool. <laughs> so Garrett was, uh, is actually a fork of a subversion code review tool that was, was named Writevelt. And it was actually spun out of an internal Google code review tool that was built on top of Perforce named Mondrian. So Garrett uh, has an interesting history. <laughs> Garrett was initially built by Sean Pierce, uh, and this is who built JGit. So JGit is a re-implementation of Git and the Git protocol in, J in Java. And he built it to serve at Google to serve the Android open source project. But now it's used in a lot of open source projects like the Go language and some professional teams. So, so something to note about Git, or Garrett actually, is that it's very Gitty. And what this means is that to actually configure Garrett, you have to create Git configuration files. So you need, you need a little bit of deep knowledge about how Git works under the hood to actually be able to configure and use and administer Garrett. So Garrett is a code hosting tool, so it works just like anything else you'd expect. You can fetch from master, you can pull in changes from various branches that it hosts, but when it comes time to actually submit things for review, you have to send things to a special branch called for slash master or for slash whatever your destination branch might be called. And, what you, and at that time, you're sending a single commit. Now, as the code review process carries on, 
You can in integrate with other tools to make sure that you have a required number of reviewers. You can verify that builds are passing. And that, that is provided through integration with things like Atlassian Bamboo or any other tools that you might have for build and testing. So what does Garrett look like? This is it. So as you can see, just like, just like in Crucible, on the left side you have red for what has been changed or removed, green for what's coming into your repository. And then you have the ability to leave a score. So rather than just a flat approval or rejection, you can actually configure a score range to decide how good or bad or maybe required some changes that this particular review needs. So the typical setup is like a plus two to minus two. So a plus two might be, yeah, this is approved. I really like it. I want you to merge this in immediately. And a minus two is more like, no, this is terrible. Please go back, make some changes, make all the changes, or maybe just never, never merge this in. So how do you actually create a Garrett code review? So after you've initially created your, actually, excuse me, <laughs> after you've initially created your Garrett code review and you want to go back and make changes, you'd go and make your changes locally. You'd go and commit them. Then you'd try to push back to that same ref that you did earlier. So as I noted earlier, there's only one commit allowed. So what Garrett's going to do, it's going to actually reject your secondary push. So you can't easily update your code review. Instead, what you need to do, as it says, is squash your commits. So Garrett really expects that you're going to have a clean history in the end. So it expects that each time you sub, you, you're pushing to the four master branch, there's only going to be a single commit. So what you have to do locally is make your changes, push initially, then every subsequent time, make your changes, squash it together, and then force push into that branch. Um, I'll have some questions at the end, if that's OK. You can also do that as well. Yep. And of course, you carry on force pushing or amending your commits as you go. Now, this is pretty similar to the way the patch set workflow works with a mailing list, and that's sort of, sort of what it's related to. The Garrett UI even goes as far as to call these patch sets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this provides a pretty clean history, very similar to the mailing list, and is definitely preferred by, by many and in some larger projects like Android. Uh, the Golang project actually also uses this and syndicates the patch sets over to a mailing list as well. So with Garrett, you get some pretty sophisticated policy enforcement. Um, that's through external integrations and, and its own review tools. It is free and open source. It's built on Java. It's built on top of JGit, so you can make changes as you like. And it definitely provides the clean commit history. Now, some downsides is that Garrett is Git only. So if you use a version or you use other tools still with other repositories, you're not going to be able to use Garrett without converting to Git or using some sort of or Git conversion. Uh, it is a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, you need to know a lot about how Git works. Iteration is a little awkward, needing to either amend or squash your commits every time. And of course, there's just, you have the one contributor per patch issue, which if you have a lot of people contributing to the same change or the same fix, that could be a problem for you. So that's sort of Garrett in a nutshell. So let's talk about pull requests now. Now pull requests uh, on Bitbucket work a little differently than, than a Crucible code review. For instance, the main thing is that Pull requests do not allow you to pull in arbitrary files or arbitrary commits from different sources. It is very strictly branch to branch only. So you have a source branch, you have a destination branch. Well, the good side of this, though, is that it's a very simple UI to be able to create a pull request. Very simply, you just select your source branch, select your destination branch or destination repository, and away you go. Now, another cool thing that you get whenever you go with sort of this linear, merging two different linear histories together, is you get a little more visibility into what issues may have been involved in those, in those particular commits and whether or not each of the commits along the way was built. And something we added recently in Bitbucket server uh, sometime last year, I believe, is iterative code review. So we sort of are trying to bring in the, better, the best or better parts of Crucible over to Bitbucket. So what Iterative Review in Bitbucket does is it actually allows you to walk each commit and see changes as they've been added. It also tracks where you have looked, what you've looked at. So as people make more changes, 
and submit more changes to your pull request, you can see those, you'll see those and you'll see those highlighted in the UI. Now, more than just a code review tool, creating a pull request or comp completing a pull request actually means that you're merging your code from a development branch probably into some sort of production bound branch. And the reason it's called a pull request is because you're actually asking your team to pull in your changes into the main line of code. And because of this, we've decorated pull requests with quite a few features to make sure that your code is actually production ready. For example, with branch restrictions or merge checks, um, depending on which, whether you use Bitbucket Cloud or server, uh, we actually disable the, the merge button based, or can disable the merge button based on whether or not you have passing builds and passing tests, or whether or not a certain number of reviewers have signed off on it. And kind of all of that goes through to make sure that your code is ready for deployment. Just a quick look at, oh, there it goes. Quick look at branch permissions in Bitbucket Cloud. We just recently added this. Um, it's been in Bitbucket Server now for, for a little while, about probably a little over a year. And it works very similarly. It allows you to request different numbers of approvals, certain number of successful builds. And all of these, again, just make sure that your code is actually ready to go out. And another cool thing that you can do is if you have uh, if you have Jira integration or uh, you create branch, a branch per issue, you can actually integrate this with Jira and automatically transition issues. So as you create a branch that has that certain issue key, Jira will automatically move it over to in progress. And then of course, once you create a pull request, it'll transition that issue to in review. And finally, either when the pull request is merged or when your CI tool is done and you've started deploying, you can actually move that issue to done automatically as well. Now, of course, with Jira, as many of you may know, has almost an infinite number of options for how to, how to transition issues and how many different statuses those can go through. So, sort of to reiterate though, pull requests are definitely the gateway between development and production. So they're the boundary between code that is alive and code that is dead. When you merge a pull request, you're pushing code out of the nest and out into your customer's hands. And in a truly automated tool chain, everything is really gonna hinge on you pressing that merge button. Now, of course, there have been drawbacks found with the pull request workflow, especially by default. <laughs> uh, merge commits. So merge commits on a very large and complex project can make a graph of your repository look a bit like a complicated level of Guitar Hero. Um, and if you compare that with a very clean and linear history of something like mail a mailing list or Git, you can see why people might prefer one over the other. Thankfully, with recent, recent versions of Bitbucket Server and very recently with Bitbucket Cloud, we've introduced merge strategies. And merge strategies give you a little more flexibility in how you merge your code whenever you're done with the pull request. And it gives you the option of choosing exactly which method you want Git to perform. Now, uh, merge strategies on Bitbucket Cloud are relatively new and we only have one option, but I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit more about Bitbucket Server and its various options. So ignore the wall of text here. We're just gonna cover the basics what's going on here. So you have five merge strategies available. No fast forward, fast forward, fast forward only, squash, and squash fast forward only. So let's drill in and kind of talk about what each of these do. So if you use git merge fast forward, which is the default in git, assuming that all of the code that is in the master branch is on your branch, when you go to merge, Git will simply update the pointer of master to your commit. Now, without getting into too much detail, Git under the hood, every single branch is just a reference to a specific, specific commit somewhere in your history. Now, if the changes that you've made have diverged from master and you don't have the latest commits from master on your branch, when you go to merge, instead of it fast forwarding and updating the pointer, it's actually gonna create a merge commit. Now, this can result for some people in a little, little bit of a mystery as to why Sometimes you're getting a merge commit and sometimes you're just getting a fast forward. So the next thing is no fast forward. So no fast forward actually forces there to be a merge commit for every single merge, whether or not you have all of the history from master. And this is actually the default in Bitbucket Cloud and Bitbucket Server and what we built both products with initially. And the main reason we did this is because we felt that it was important to have a logical mapping between your pull requests, your issues, and your branches. For example, all of our merge commits, if you'll notice the message usually includes the pull request number and what branches may have been involved in that, in that particular merge. Then there's 
fast forward only. So when you fast forward only, it assumes that you already have all the thing, all of the code from master and all the commits there. And it will create just an updated pointer. But if you've diverged, now Git will actually reject your merge. It means what you need to do is go back and amend or rebase your changes back on top of back on top of the latest commits of master. And of course, once you do that, it'll be happy with you again and allow you, and go ahead and move that pointer forward. And finally, just git merge squash, or second, almost finally, actually. <laughs> uh, and what this does is it, this works a lot like Garrett. So when you go to merge your pull request, what we'll do is actually combine all of your commits together and all of your changes together into a single commit. So this, this is, if you want the same kind of workflow that Garrett could give you, or a mailing list workflow where you just have single commits going into your master branch, a very clean history, this is definitely the way to go. Now, of course, if there are multiple authors and multiple people contributing changes along the way, you're going to lose some visibility into that. And then, actually, finally, is squash and fast forward only. So this works exactly like we just saw with squash, where we create a single commit. But if you've diverged from master now, you actually can't. You can't create the merge commit, or you can't create the merge. So instead, what you'd need to do, just like we saw before with, no, with fast forward only, is go back and rebase your changes. And then, you can, then it will allow you to squash and make your changes. So what do I think you should use? Well, at last end, we use quite a few different things. So <laughs> the merge commit offers you kind of an ugly history. So you have all those merge commits. You have every commit, but you have full traceability, and it's pretty hard to mess up. With fast forward only uh, merges, you have no merge commits. You have a pretty verbose history. And, uh, but it does require rebasing, which could be a little tricky for some people. And then, of course, with squash, you get a very concise history, but you lose a lot of context about how things evolved. Now, at Atlassian, as I said, we use a little bit of everything. So, but we mostly stick with the defaults. Um, that's, we, we built it and we use it uh, that way. I know that's how we do it on the Bitbucket Cloud team, is we just let the merge commit happen, and that's how we know when, when things have hit our main production branches. Some teams prefer fast forward only, and that's what they like. <laughs> and then, of course, there are a couple of teams, including uh, some of our external libraries that we use on Bitbucket, that we prefer squash, just because the library is pretty simple. We want a simple history. We don't need, we don't need all the details that have happened over time. So in summary, pull requests offer really sophisticated policy enforcement. Between merge checks and all of the integrations that you get there, you get quite a lot of uh, ability to, uh, to restrict how code is going to go into your branches, into your main branches. You have your choice of merge strategies, as we just saw. And of course, multiple team members can author code under review. And then lastly, if you're using Bitbucket Cloud, you get Git or Mercurial as a choice. And if you're using Bitbucket Server, you get Git. Of course, major drawback is that it's a lot less flexible than something like Crucible. You're stuck with just two main lines of branches that you're going to merge together. So who do I think should use which ones? So if you, if you have a need to review multiple repositories at once or maybe cherry pick files, then you definitely want a more traditional code review process with something like Crucible. If your team's not on Git and not, or not on Mercurial, it could be a problem. If you have a really heavy iterative workflow, meaning that you've got, maybe you've got to do due diligence on, uh, on a large product, project that you're evaluating, you may have code from a lot of different sources. You may have a rel relatively large code review. You definitely want, want to probably use something like Crucible. Finally, uh, it's a bit of a joke. Uh, if you are afraid of branches um, or forking, I know some people prefer just to merge straight into master. And uh, we've given, at the last end, I think, dozens of talks on why you should use branches. But you know, it's up to you, and it's your code base. Uh, so if you don't use branches, then you might not want to use uh, you might not want to use something like uh, pull requests. <laughs> but I think literally everyone else should probably use pull requests. If you have a pretty simple history or you're using just pretty parallel branches, it's going to work just fine. And of course, you can always combine them. As we said earlier, that 
Crucible is not a host anyway, and it can reach out to any particular other host and bring in code. So you can use Crucible for your more complex code review or maybe your after commit or after deployment code review and then pull requests to, to kind of gate check things as they go in. Seem to have hit the end pretty quick. <laughs> um, so if you're looking for more information, uh, you can go check out bitbucket.org. You can check out our blog. Uh, we've, we've definitely put a lot of content out there lately. Uh, if you want to know more about Crucible, you can go check that out. And of course, Garrett, we don't make, we're not involved in, but we're happy to, happy to tell you where to go find it. <laughs> Uh, and finally, you'll notice that my Twitter handle's not up there, and that's mostly because I post pictures of cats and things like that. You don't want to follow me. But my buddy Tim Pedersen, uh, he works for us, and he loves Git, and he talks quite a lot about it and gives quite a lot of talks around the world about Git. So if you have any complicated or interesting questions or you just want to follow and get the full story on what's happening with Git, definitely follow my buddy Tim. So with that, I can open up for a few questions. Uh, right here? Yeah. Okay. So, um, in Red and Blue Storm, you said that there's four slash maximum. Throughout the GCC, you made a successful slash review. So, is it the same thing for master branch for like all the team members to push and push or review? Uh, actually, I'm not sure. I believe it is, though. I think, nope, it's not. So the question was whether Garrett allows you to have uh, more than one team member submitting to the four master branch. And so can, you, can you repeat your answer one more time? Gotcha. Anybody else? Over there. So the question was, what are the differences between GitHub and Bitbucket? Um, as far as pull requests go, um, I think one of the main differences is uh, our merge checks and branch restrictions. Uh, I know GitHub's recently introduced some similar tools, uh, but we've had We've had quite a lot of integrations with other tools for a while in our pull requests that allow you to kind of gate check being able to merge and on a variety of criteria. Um, also, being able to enforce approvers uh, is something we've had for quite a while. I think now they've come a little closer to us, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so I think there's, there are some differences um, and we're, some similarities as well. Any other questions? Sir. Sure. This is a great philosophical debate. <laughs> um, we mostly don't mind having the, the, the full history that includes all of that information. Um, and I think you'll find that a lot of teams around Atlassian feel that way. There are a few that don't, but they're kind of far and few between, or maybe, they're on, or maybe they try out different things on certain sub-libraries or sub-projects of our larger products. So like in practice, it's not a huge issue? For us, no. I don't think so. Like the, the, the Bitbucket cloud code base has, has, we have quite a large team now, so there's just a ton going on. Our, our, our graph looks a lot like that Guitar Hero graph, <laughs> and it doesn't really, doesn't really bother us that much, and we can still find what we need to find when we're digging around in our history. Does anybody else have any other questions? So the question was, uh, it's had a few, a few instances where, uh, where the questioner has worked where Crucible hasn't scaled very well. And he was asking, how, how are we working on that? And how do we handle that inside Atlassian? Um, so honestly, there's a, there's a lot fewer teams using Crucible. 
um, these days, but we do still have people devoted to working on Crucible and improving the performance of both Fisheye and Crucible. And I know there have been quite a few changes made in probably the last two years or so to improve performance and scalability. Uh, and if you want to talk about more, you can come by the Atlassian booth afterwards, and we can talk about it in depth. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, the question was, do we in Atlassian uh, try to keep our commit history clean so that Git bisect works better? And the answer is it's team by team. Um, I know in, in Bitbucket, we don't, we don't really put a lot of effort into it, and we don't have, we don't have that, ma that many problems really like that. And what we usually do is use the pull request commits to sort of bounce around and figure out what's, what's been merged in and what's been changed that may have affected something that went out to production. Um, I can't speak for other teams, uh, though. Any other questions? Sir? So this is your primary like, focus on the code review. So I'm wondering, as the world is moving towards a full stack model, so I'm wondering if in Atlassian, do you guys use Crucible or like, do you use Redwood for code review? So the question is, do we use Crucible? Um, some of our teams still do, definitely. Um, some of our server product teams still use it and they still prefer it, or, and they'll sometimes go back and do some like after commit or after release code review with Crucible. Uh, and of course, we still have the Fisheye, Crucible, and Clover people that, that tend to use and dog food their own products over, over pull requests. Any other questions? So you're asking, are, do we use automated, automated testing tools? And do we use those in Atlassian? Um, not a bunch. We do use some coverage tools. Um, so for instance, we have Clover, but we, uh, on the Bitbucket team, we also use, I believe it's, I believe it's just called Cover, um, that just, validates code covers, but we don't use a lot of uh, defect detection. We do use some security detection software uh, that I'm not really, sh I don't actually know off the top of my head what we, which particular product we use, but we do use some, some automated detection, but not a, lot of, not a lot of specific defect and bug detection like that. Do you have any other questions? Cool, wait, did you? Is that it? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Thank you.